Hi everyone, welcome to our wrap program, um, Let's Coffee and Connect meeting. Um, let's just allow two more minutes to the attendees that are on the process of logging in. And we are going to be starting point two um, right away. Okay, so thank you in advance for, for being here and for allowing us these two extra minutes. Okay, so let's get it started and people will be able to join us while we uh, present. Um, first of all, thanks for, for allowing uh, time to be here and for being here. Um, welcome again to our wrap program, Leeds Coffee and Connect meeting. And really looking forward to, to having this, this meeting with you. My name is Franco Asato. I am the training and accreditation coordinator with IRAP since February of 2022. Uh, I have met a lot of you guys in the in the process of my beginning of this journey with IRAP, but really looking forward to meeting all of those I haven't met yet. There's my email, you can contact me whenever whenever you need, and I'll be happy to, to assist. Just before we start, let's do some housekeeping uh, for this session. Uh, this session has around 75 minutes in total, including the time for questions. And this session is also being recorded. You will get the presentation files as well as the video. Uh, hopefully tomorrow uh, you will receive a link to access to, to these files. Um, also, you may have realized that your mic microphones are muted, but you're welcome to post any questions that you have on our chat, you are seeing there the control panel that you should have uh, that go to webinars these tools offer. Um, and also we will allow time for open microphone discussion at the end of the session and also at the middle we will have a time for, for discussion with open mics because we really want to, to hear you. Um, okay, so let me present you our three presenters uh, in this meeting. From IRAP, we have Judy Williams, its program, its global program and communications manager, and Greg Smith, its global program director. And we also have from the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety, Valeria Mota, who is his advocacy and partnerships director. Judy, uh, you want to take the floor? Thanks, Franco, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We have nearly 50 people on our call from 27 countries, which is a great result considering how many online meetings there are and how busy our calendars are these days. 
We really love this special opportunity to gather you all together as leads of reps to learn from one another, share your news and advice and create friendships as we're on this important journey. It's my pleasure to share our global and national updates. There's lots to tell. Measuring our programs is really important um, for understanding opportunities and validating our work and success. Franco, if you don't mind just skipping through a couple of those slides for me, please, just to the metrics. What you can see coming up here, thanks, is IREP's global metrics as at the end of December. We prepare and report these in June and December to you, our major donor, the FIA Foundation, and of course to the world. Metrics for all our countries feeds into this, and I can produce similar for every country. It's very much a consultation process. I draw as much as I can of knowledge from VIDA and our IREP Connect, which is our partner management system, and I share your natural metrics with you to add your local knowledge. Our combined inputs is what is finalised and then reported out. I hope our metrics work really supports you, providing valuable national data to report back to your countries and partners. I'll be in touch soon for this next June update. Since we last spoke, we've also released our 2021 annual report. It's a digital story, very image rich and text light. And if you haven't yet had the opportunity to view it, I recommend you take a look. You may find yourself featured. So let's take a quick trip around the world and have a look at recent exciting happenings. In global news last week, we reported that 22 national road safety strategies include now RAP metrics as national targets for safer road infrastructure. These are in countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Croatia, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, China, Greece, New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Slovenia. In addition, Alberta has set targets for safety commitments on their toll network, which is across 15 countries. In combination, these strategies have a safety impact in 70 countries, which is huge. In addition, many development banks, of course, also have set start rating targets in their projects across countries. I'm really proud to see 2030 strategies just like this one for Vietnam, which includes targets like we see here in the wording above the green band. It's, their target is to achieve 100% of national highways and provincial roads at a grade three or higher standard, and 75% of the total length of their national highway to reach three stars or more, according to IRAP. Of course, this aligns beautifully to the UN targets three and four. I encourage you to visit our website post. The link is just written here in the orange and see the overview of the strategies. You'll see graphics just like this one, showing you the countries with the great strategies, the relevant target text picked out, and a link if you'd like to download the policies. These are great examples to share in your countries and encourage your governments to copy. Further, we've also enhanced the Where We Work map on our irap.org website. Note the address that we have listed here. When you click on a country like Vietnam, you can now see more metrics, three-star better policy if it exists, and link out to vaccines for roads, injury, and business case data for the country. This is really valuable. For example, if you see or hear that Vietnam's got a great 2030 strategy, you can visit where we work to see the summary of the national metrics, download and review that strategy, and perhaps reach out to Greg, who's the lead there with his details, to discuss his local experience and what local partners have done to secure these results. I really encourage you to collaborate in this way. NGOs have met with ministers also in 36 countries to hand over the global plan and encourage them to implement it in their national strategies. Do you know if this has happened in your country and are you connecting with your local NGOs? Valeria will be able to tell us more about this. The Global Alliance's Commit to Act campaign ran last week and calls for government decision makers to make specific measurable road safety commitments and to put these targets into action. 123 commitments are registered on the Alliance's Global Global Commitment Tracker. It's worth a look to see what's published for your country. The publication of great national strategies and global plan handovers has well prepared everyone for last week's ITF summit. The International Transport Forum brought together transport ministers and road safety stakeholders for 63 member countries to look at how we can make transport more inclusive for societies and in particular, how to achieve um, changes on scale through policy. The UN high level meeting, of course, is also coming up. Uh, that's the one for global road safety. We're just five weeks away from it now, and it's the first ever UN high level meeting in New York. It's going to bring together the heads of state, so the prime ministers and presidents, to look at how we halve global road deaths and injuries by 2030. Back in February, IRAP wrote letters to all the heads of states and countries via the UN permanent missions. 
and we encourage them to implement the global plan and write their own national strategies to align to it. We ask them to actively participate in the global meeting and share their safer road success. Of course, a local approach is always going to be the best. And we found that more than 50 countries have advised they've taken that letter and met with their ministers and heads of state too, to encourage their participation. We're very cognizant of the political challenges that are around the high level meeting and the UNRSC statement of concern regarding Russia's involvement. We're sensitive to this topic and for any countries that are participating, we are always keen to support you in your efforts. Thank you if you've met with your ministers to encourage their participation in these meetings and to encourage them to implement the global plan. Moving on, the UN Road Safety Fund is calling for proposals by 30 June. The fund dispersed a total of $4 million last year in the last call. Priorities this year, are they're looking for technical assistance to identify gaps and improve national plans and to implement specific actions to improve national road safety and its management. The fund may be providing an opportunity for your programs. On to national highlights now. Brazil's National Department of Transport Infrastructure, DNIT, was recently awarded an IRAP Five Star Performer Award. This recognised the exceptional leadership of developing Brazil RAP, which has excelled in building local capacity, its application of the IRAP methodology across its federal roads, a 62,000 kilometre assessment of which 26,000 kilometres has been completed, and many, many more um, accomplishments, such as implementing three star or better policy, including on their concessions. In the Dominican Republic, the Inter-American Development Bank has funded a 1,100 kilometer IRAP assessment. EuroRAP has been running some lunchtime seminars for knowledge sharing. The agenda changes each month, sometimes sharing European case studies of success, or sometimes providing greater insight on RAP tools. All of you are welcome to attend these. Also in Europe, projects Radar and Slane have come to um, for the focus of many across that region. They have been both multinational projects that have involved 12 and four Danube countries respectively. Project Sabrina is also underway covering 11 Danube countries and it aims to tackle cycling safety um, on the infrastructure across that region. There's lots of great multicultural um, country impact in Europe with these three projects. The Millennium Challenge Corporation has funded the star rating of 50 kilometres of designs for a project with Aegis in Cote d'Ivoire. We have a global goal, of course, for every star rating design in the world, or every road design in the world, to have a star rating target. And Greg will share more with you shortly on our initiatives in this space. TANRAP is launching next month. Tanzania is the first country to implement the 10-step plan for safe road infrastructure. And we really look forward to celebrating this milestone with our local partners. The development of Moro RAP for Morocco is going well. Last week at ITF, IRAP and representatives of the National Road Safety Agency and General Department of Roads signed an MOU to work together to develop a program. Nearly 45,000 kilometres has been risk mapped in the country so far. The Department of Roads has recently completed a World Bank funded 1,500 kilometre assessment um, on the high risk national highways of Nepal. In Pakistan, the assessment of 15,570 kilometres of the National Highway Network is complete and a new National Road Safety Agency has launched in Senegal. And finally, in the United States, a Winnebago tribe uh, project has kicked off in Nebraska and a safe system coding comparison report is being developed to be released at the TRB conference in January. Hot off the press, just to my email a few moments ago, uh, was that TIRAP has today been awarded the Prime Minister's Award, which is a a really wonderful um, national achievement for them. So more to come on this soon. And lastly, just a reminder for each of you that the IRAP Partner Portal is free and it's highly valuable for you to use at any time. So it's sharing for you in every country, the news, reports and knowledge, training and projects that have occurred. For the first time, it's giving us the opportunity to have an online way to share 20 years of IRAP knowledge of your countries with all of you instantly and freely. So if you haven't yet accessed it, I encourage you to do so and contribute to it so that you can build your national records. We love hearing about your great work and sharing it. It's not only great to celebrate your success, but also I know it inspires so many as they progress. Please do stay in touch with me and let me know how you're going. I'll now hand on to Greg, who's just going to share some updates on IRAP initiatives as well. Thanks, Greg.
Thank you, Judy. And uh, Franco, if you could go to the next spot. Uh, and hi, everyone. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to join us. Um, so our star rating for designs initiative is one of our flagship programs. And the goal with that really is to find a way to ensure that every design in the world has a star rating. And ultimately, every design achieves that three star or better target that aligns with the global plan for the decade of action. The thing that we've done most recently is establish a consultation group of designers from around the world. There's 16 designers that have joined that group um, to help give us really first-hand experience about how they go about designing um, their roads and trying to give us, or where we're trying to um, uh, get their feedback and insights about um, the processes that they follow and what we can do to best help them ensure that every design gets a star rating. So we'll be announcing the, the members of that group quite soon. But we've also established a mailing group of people who are interested in staying in touch with Star Rating for Designs. And if you're interested to keep it up to date specifically with the Designs Initiative, um, please do get in touch with Judy and she'll add you to the list. On the next one, please. So another piece of work that we've been doing very closely with the Asian Development Bank and also Safe System Solutions, one of the accredited suppliers uh, based in Australia, is to develop a manual on how to link together star ratings and road safety audits. It's a question that we've been, uh, we've gotten over many years. Um, sometimes people will ask us, should I do a road safety audit or should I do IRAP? What this manual really explains is that there's a good way to do them both together. Uh, and by bringing the two approaches together, you can get a much stronger outcome um, that leverages both the data and evidence approach of IRAP uh, and its metrics with the expertise that you can bring to bear with the, the road safety audit. So it presents a few different methodologies for how you can approach that. One um, starting with the light, quite light touch and quite easy approach and one that's more, more sophisticated and takes more time. So that manual will be published by the Asian Development Bank and it focuses on the uh, Karak region, the Central Asia region, but really the content is going to be applicable worldwide. That should be published in June or July this year. Also, you might be aware of the Cycle Wrap initiative. Cycle Wrap is a model that's designed specifically for assessing infrastructure for bicycles. The standard IRAP model includes a module for bicycles, but what Cycle Wrap does is take that to the next level uh, with more detail and um, a little bit more sophistication. So that's going to be officially launched at um, the VeloCity conference. Uh, in Ljubljana in uh, early on to mid June 14 to 17 of June. That will initially, I guess, um, be focused on um, pilot projects and specifically working with suppliers and organisations who have experience with using the tool through the development phase. But over time, it will be opened up um, uh, more extensively for, for people to use around the world. The CycleWrap model has been developed in consultation with the CycleWrap consultation group. Um, and you can find out more about the CycleWrap initiative on our website if you go to irap.org slash CycleWrap. The Road Safety Toolkit, um, which you may have seen over the years, has been um, I've had a major refresh and uh, update. Um, that's been done with the support of the Bloomberg um, Global Initiative for Road Safety and the Global Road Safety Facility. Um, the toolkit covers not only infrastructure issues, but actually the whole range of road safety issues. It explores uh, um, different road user types, different crash types, different road types, but also treatments that relate to people to vehicles, infrastructure, and also deals quite extensively with management related issues in road safety. That's been developed, this, this update particularly has been developed in lots of consultation with the Global Road Safety Facility, but also organisations like Global Road Safety Partnership, uh, GNCAP and EAST. It contains more than 600 photos, more than 100 case studies and more than 100 reference documents. So it's an incredibly powerful and useful resource and really encourage you to take a look at the update. And if you have any comments or you'd like to contribute to the, web, uh, the toolkit, so if you'd like to contribute images, photos of your work or case studies, we'd really love to receive it. And uh, we'd be very happy to include it in the toolkit and, and give you acknowledgement for that. Also, the World Bank is going to be launching on the 7th of June. Uh, the report into mobilising private finance for road safety. 
That's a piece of work that uh, was led by the International Finance Corporation um, branch of the World Bank. Uh, but IRAP also collaborated, collaborated very closely with that, as did the FIA Foundation. It presents a series of different models that could be used to mobilise private sector financing for road safety, for infrastructure, uh, for behavioural related programs such as helmet wearing and also vehicle safety. Um, it reflects quite a bit of the work that has already been very successfully uh, rolled out in Brazil, where concession road um, uh, concessionaires are owning or running concession roads have been set the challenge of reaching star rating targets, and they do so. In doing so, they they access financial um, uh, um, incentives as well. So that will be launched on the 7th of June. It's well worth a look because it really goes to the heart of one of the key road safety challenges that we have, which is finding funding to, to implement uh, improvements. And within our AI RAP initiative, that's the Accelerated Intelligent Road Assessment Program um, initiative, there's two key programs that are, or projects that are coming to a conclusion. And when they do, we'll be able to publish some very inform interesting information um, about this new generation of, of approaching road assessments. The first one is has been focused on collecting or using automated processes to collect IRAP data across 20,000 kilometres in one of the provinces in Australia. That's a piece of work that was led by the provincial government, the New South Wales government, but also we worked very closely with TomTom and Ndidi, which are data suppliers, um, and have worked very closely with us to find ways to turn their vast data stores into IRAP data that can be used for road safety. The second one has been working with the World Bank and the Global Road Safety Facility through the Regional Road Safety Observatory uh, in Africa, um, focusing in on Kenya and Ethiopia and using satellite imagery to find uh, ways to detect where most traffic travels throughout the network. They're trying to map out where 75% or more um, of traffic and travel happens on or 75% of travel happens on networks, but also trying to use that data, that satellite imagery data to calculate traffic speeds as well. Um, that's been working with a company called Agilisys and they've come up with a methodology for, for doing that. And so each one of those two projects will provide a basis for potentially further applications of that sort of technology to really try and accelerate the use of the IRAP assessments across vast and, and really large networks um, much more quickly and, and more cost effectively. And in conjunction with that, we've also introduced a new IRAP accreditation category for that AI RAP data. So quite soon, two companies will be um, awarded the first AI RAP accreditations for the data that's produced using their automated systems. Um, so keep an eye out for that, and we'll be making announcements about that quite soon. Thank you, Franco. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, does anyone have any questions on our updates or on this updates and key initiatives? Uh, please uh, raise your hands and, and I'll be more than happy to to open your mic. Uh, we don't have written questions so far. Okay, so we can, yeah, we can move on, Greg. Uh, to continuing your presentation and we'll see if we have questions uh, finishing uh, the presentations. Thanks Franco and yeah like Franco said if you have any questions please do write it in the chat um, or let Franco know and, and we can pause and, and open your mic to have a chat. We we are actually always very keen to hear from you um, and very very keen to hear your questions but also um, any of your news or ideas. Um, so in this section, and Franco, I think you could go to the, the next slide. Um, I just want to say some words before Valeria takes the microphone. Valeria from the Global Alliance of NGOs, she's going to be speaking about partnerships for road safety. Um, but before she does, I just want to spend a moment to talk a little bit more about road assessment programs or, or the RAPs themselves, um, because it's often a question about, uh, we often get a question about what exactly is a RAP, um, how should a RAP form, um, and uh, what are the key characteristics of a RAP. Um, so some of the common themes that define a road assessment program or a RAP are number one, that they're focused on saving lives through road infrastructure or safer roads. That's really at the core, the idea that we're trying to find ways to prevent 
trauma on our roads through better design um, and linking to better land use planning um, and modal, modal um, shift planning um, and also through speed management. They also make use of the RAP tools, methodology and resources. So that's always a defining feature of a RAP. But I should just say that's not an exclusive feature. Um, RAPs also very much make use of different types of tools um, in order to promote, promote that safer roads uh, mission. So that might be working with road safety audits, crash data systems, for example. So the RAP tools are really there to complement those sorts of tools and in any way that, that needs to be done in order to achieve that goal of, of making roads safer. The RAPs also bring together partners for a common purpose and that's a really important part and that's one that particularly um, Valeria is going to be speaking about in a moment. So we, we do offer a framework for how RAPs can be established, but really there isn't any one size fits all model. Brazil RAP, OzRAP, India RAP, Thai RAP and others all are RAPs, but they have different characteristics. Each of the RAPs tend to focus on different priorities and activities that match their local context and needs. And I'll give a few examples of those in a moment. But in many, in fact, actually I think we're still on the, the previous slide, um, Franco. But in fact, many countries are making achievements. Sorry, Franco, if you would mind going backwards two slides. Excellent. So many countries are making achievements that we would associate with a highly successful RAP, even though a RAP hasn't been formally established. So Vietnam is a really nice example. There isn't a Vietnam RAP, but in Vietnam, there is a really strong commitment to achieving star rating targets, like Julius, uh, Judy said a little earlier. There's also dozens of experts who've taken training in using the RAP tools and the RAP tools themselves are being used in often very innovative ways to drive development of a safer road network. So all the characteristics of a strong RAP are there. We're very, very pleased to see that um, in Vietnam, all the tools and the resources are being really used very effectively to save lives. So whether or not you choose to create a formal RAP in your country, Key is that if you're interested in using the RAP resources to create safer roads and safe lives, then we consider you part of the, the RAP family. So all that said, there are some key areas of focus that we know that really are associated with success. And I'm going to step through a few of those right now. So on the next slide, um, we can see there's a there's the red or the orange box there that's talking about program leadership. So whether it's like a one local champion in a country who's able to bring together others, or like in Australia, where OSRAP is led by a committee that's organised by the road authorities. We know that programs are more likely to be successful when they have strong and inspiring leadership. So if that's one area of focus, or if you had to pick one area of focus, that's an area that we know is linked to good success in road safety. Another area is obviously using the RAP tool, performing what we call assessments. That might be using the crash rate risk mapping methodology. It might be using the star rating for schools methodology. It might be performing IRAP assessments or star rating assessments on existing roads or doing star rating for designs. It can begin small with small pilot projects of just a few kilometres or like in Colombia right now where there's network wide assessments happening with the support of the government, the Global Road Safety Facility, the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. The data that, and the metrics get, that get generated in an IRAP assessment and any type of IRAP assessment really do provide a foundation for planning road safety and taking action on road safety as well. We know that countries with strong policies and ambitious but achievable targets tend to fall, perform best. And as Jude mentioned earlier, there are now dozens of countries that have policies in place that very much align with the global plan for the decade of action and also support the achievement of three star or better roads. So again, that's a key area that you might like to focus on if you haven't already got a policy uh, in place in your country, uh, because it can really set the tone for how infrastructure safety plays out over decades or more. Providing training for local engineers and organisations to build their capacity in safe road engineering, but also in using the RAP tools is really essential for long-term success. And that, apart from giving that technical expertise about road infrastructure safety and the tools, 
It also helps to build a cohort of people who are really capable of advocating for safer roads. And that's another element that Valeria is going to talk a little bit about um, soon, about the importance of advocacy for road safety. Mobilising investment is obviously critically important. And like I said, the World Bank will be launching their report on mobilising private sector investment in road safety early uh, next month in the 7th of June. So whether it's a small budget for a demonstration project or like at a, at a single school, or like in Brazil, where they've been able to mobilise hundreds of millions of dollars of private sector investment and private sector linked investment in concession roads to ensure that those roads get to three stars or better. However many dollars you're able to mobilise, anything can make a difference for road safety. So ensuring that within your RAP efforts, uh, keeping a focus on where investment might come from to support the implementation of, of safety initiatives is really, really valuable. And there's enormous resources around the world and in, throughout all our partners to help find ways to support that. Jude mentioned earlier that the United Nations Road Safety Fund is currently calling for grant proposals uh, for road safety projects. So if you haven't seen that already, please do take a look at it um, and take the chance to, to think about an application. We also know that a life won't be saved until roads are upgraded and speeds are managed well. So clearly and obviously a focus on ensuring that whatever RAP assessments have happened and whatever training has happened, all of that translates into some sort of actual impacts of physical impact on the ground, whether it's changes to speed limits and traffic calming, or like the AIP team in Vietnam has done recently with the government and through the Botna project to really implement safe and accessible infrastructure around a series of schools. Getting that change on the ground is incredibly important. That's the point at which you, you can start to really save lives. So within a RAP program, ensuring that you're dedicating enough time and, and thought to how you actually get things built on the ground. Um, we know that producing star ratings is incredibly useful, incredibly valuable, but it's definitely not the end point. That's really just opening the door towards the stage where we, we get something built. Good communications is incredibly powerful and, and done well. It can really amplify the value of the work that you're doing. Um, our former chairman, John Dawson, used to always call on us to do good things and tell people about it. Um, we do run the risk sometimes of doing really good things, but not telling people about it. And so not connecting the dots to everyone that needs to know um, and everyone that can also help push that good thing through to its final conclusion, which could save a life. So we know that through strong and open communications, we can create this strong community that really understands and supports your efforts in, in safer roads. That community, community can help to mobilise um, action on policy, investment, capacity building, for example. So that picture that you can see there is from the TIRAP team. They have a really active presence on Facebook and they do a lot of communications about a range of road safety topics. Uh, including very much infrastructure, but also branching out into related topics as well, all within the context of the safe system. So that picture there is talking about global road safety performance targets number three and four. And like Jude said, they've just won an award from the Prime Minister of, of Thailand for road safety. Um, and a big part of their identity has been helping to raise awareness and, and connect um, through good communications, all the players that need to know about um, the importance of infrastructure safety, but also the latest initiatives that are happening. And like Jude mentioned, collecting data continuously um, and measuring your impact is incredibly important and incredibly valuable. That data gives you a chance to evaluate your impact and give you a chance to understand what is working really well, but also sometimes what's not working well, uh, and therefore giving you a chance to consider what changes or different directions you might need to take but also it really helps you to celebrate success and it feeds that positive communications that I was just talking about. So all the metrics that Jude regularly asks you to share with us um, go into a package that you can see presented in that little infographic on the right hand side. But those infographics could also be presented at the country level to help support your initiatives and, and your efforts as well. And by publishing that consistently over time, it helps to build a strong narrative about progress that's being made and helps to build momentum um, about the, the work that you're doing. 
And the last point I just wanted to make, and this is really the, the really leads into Valeria's presentation, is that no one organization or person can make all of those things happen. It really does require an, like an ecosystem of partners that bring together their own expertise and capabilities, but working together for that common cause, whether it's road authorities, NGOs, consultants, development banks, researchers, professional bodies, we all have a role to play in creating safer roads to save lives. So I guess if there's a, a, a key set of things that you would focus on if you wanted to be a really successful wrap, those list of actions that I've just run through um, and, and I guess uh, surrounded by that ecosystem of partners all playing a role, um, that really is a formula for success. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Valeria, who's going to talk um, more about the partnerships in, in road safety and how that can support the creation of strong RAP ecosystems and how your RAP ecosystem might connect into other fields of road safety as well. So just as a little bit of an introduction, Valeria Mose is uh, the Director of Advocacy and Partnerships at the Global Alliance for, the, um, for Road Safety NGOs. The Global Alliance represents more than 250 uh, member NGOs that work in road safety from more than 90 countries around the world. Um, the Alliance is a member of the UN Global Road Safety Collaboration and really is a leading voice in global road safety. Um, so Valerie has been with the Alliance since 2016 and she's responsible for the design and implementation of the Alliance's policy and accountability work and delivery of advocacy campaigns. So with that, Valerie, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Greg, for such an amazing introduction. <laughs> and uh, um, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this Coffee and Connect session. And I hope that what I'm here to, uh, to share with you uh, adds value. And of course, I'm totally open for questions. So if you have any doubts or comments, probably you just type it in the chat and Frank always let, will let us know. Um, so let's let's start, uh, Franco. Yeah. So today, in these brief 10-15 minutes, I want to share two main concepts. Obviously, tell you tells you what the alliance is for those who are not familiar. But then I want to talk with you about how NGOs, SDGs, and the global plan for the road safety decade of action are linked, and and why we need NGOs, and then what are the benefits of leveraging the partnerships that, uh, in a very graphic and very clear way, uh, Greg was mentioning about building an ecosystem. Uh, because as you know, we have this says, that, not this says, but a, a great author says, no men or women is an island. So that also plays for, for us, the organizations. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you a, a brief, um, a, a, yeah, a, a brief description of, of what the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety is. Uh, we are an organization that we have as a mission to mobilize and empower NGOs around the world so they can act together to make roads safe for all uh, road users and also advocate for the rights of victims. Um, and this picture is uh, its kind of like what we are, a diverse group of people from different backgrounds, different uh, regions, uh, and with different like um, core work from our organizations, but with the same interest that is to save lives on the roads. Uh, maybe some of you can find yourself there. <laughs> this was from our uh, last global meeting in 2018 before COVID started that, that we were able to, to get together over 280 NGOs representatives. Next slide, please. So as, as Greg mentioned, um, up to date right now, we have 302 member NGOs from 100 countries. Um, to become an, a, a member of the Alliance, we have obviously specific requirements, but the main points is that you, you work on road safety. That's one of your main topics. You are a non-governmental organization, so there is no link or ties with the government. You, of course, can work with the government, but you don't depend on the government. Um, and finally, we, 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 we look for organizations that have legal entities established. Um, but that's just like a, a, a brief uh, yeah, knowledge. Next slide, please. So what is our scope of work? What do we do in this um, umbrella organization? So we have three uh, areas of work. On one side, we try to strengthen the network of organizations that are part of the Alliance and, and share knowledge, right? So like from the basis of what the Alliance is, the, building this network, building this ecosystem is at, our, at, at the core of our work. Um, and, and the aim of this is that we create this really strong network that can support to put the road safety agenda 
uh, at the highest level and also disseminate uh, some key activities or initiatives such as the Young Road Safety Week, the Global Plan, or best practices carried out by other stakeholders like, for example, star rating for schools. Um, the other thing that we do is that we work on advocacy and accountability. We mobilize our NGOs through different campaigns and initiatives so they can take advocacy actions in their countries and also we strengthen their voice so they can hold their governments to account of the, of the promises that were made, of the commitments that were brought up. Not only to the NGOs, but also uh, at, at some other global frameworks such as, for example, COP26, or by signing an agreement from WP29, etc. Um, and finally, we provide capacity building because in order to have a strong network, in order to be able to do accountability, we have to be equipped uh, as the Alliance, but also our member NGOs. So we, we look to empower um, civil society uh, organizations and we try to bridge that gap of knowledge by increasing the capacity and access to tools, information and other opportunities. Um, so, for example, these wonderful tools that you have at, at, at IRAP, a lot of our members have participated of different trainings that we have facilitated and, and done in collaboration um, with IRAP and other organizations. Next slide, please. Great. So let's start with the, 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 the first topic. So as I mentioned in, in the brief introduction, what I wanted to share with you today is like the NGOs, SDGs and the Global Plan. So working on road safety, we're usually um, focused on, on this. We have like two big global frameworks, right? The Sustainable Development Goals and the Global Plan for the Decade of Action. The Sustainable Development Goals, we usually focus on number 3.6 and number 11.2 which are the very straightforward in terms of road safety, are those that says that we need to halve road deaths um, by 50% by 2030, and that we have to work to have safe and sustainable cities. And, and that is perfect, and, and that is like, it's a perfect fit to what we do. But we also can't forget that there's another SDGs that works perfectly for us and, uh, and from, for, for anyone working on, on, on development, that is that we need to have partnerships to achieve the goal. And this is what Greg was mentioning. It's impossible that only one organization or one entity or even one authority can achieve everything by, by, by itself. So it's really important to have the partnership aspect on the table. Next slide, please. Yeah, there. And, uh, and what is the other big, sorry, Rafia. What is the other big uh, framework that we have that was launched last year is the global plan. And the global plan, uh, um, it, it's, it's bringing us uh, what we have to do, how we have to do it, and who has to do it, right? So it's putting a bit of prioritization in the interventions that are needing, uh, having safe system approach as, as the north <laughs> of, of, our, of our path. So we make sure that we leave no one behind and we put people at the center of all the interventions that we do. And, and also it talks about who has to do it, right? So, so this brings again a bit of the ecosystem and the partnerships needs that, that Greg was men mentioning and that I want to share with you. Here, if you see who has to do it, yes, we have the government, but also we have the civil society, we have uh, the private companies, we have UN agencies, and we have the, the funders. The funders can be private philanthropies, or those can be also um, pri private companies, or even individuals. So, so the global plan is actually talking to us about shared responsibility, and, uh, and I think this shared responsibility comes with the, the partnership aspect. When, when we talk about shared responsibility, um, we like to think that the responsibility is about for those who have the power to make the change. So for those who are leading uh, these entities that are here mentioned of who are the ones who have to do it, uh, those are the ones who have the responsibility to share the, 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 the task to improve road safety. And that connects with the need of partner between, be, between the, the stakeholders that are playing there. Next slide, please. And then um, I know I, I've seen the registration list, so I, I know that some of you are NGOs, but I know some of you come from the academia and also fr from the government. I think I saw two. So, so what we need NGOs, and uh, this this comes from a, a study that we did within uh, from the alliance um, when we ask our member base, so the 300 member NGOs, uh, what were the things that uh, hampered a bit the previous decade of action, right? And the number one point was the lack of political will. And, uh, and, and by political will, again, going back to the shared responsibility, is not only on those national authorities, but also lack of political will on those who have the power to influence those decision makers or who are decision makers, let's say, from the private sector, like a concessionary that is building a highway. 
Um, so there was a lack of political wills on implementing the things that we know that work, on implementing evidence-based interventions, and, uh, and, and in a way evading, evading accountability. Why? Because it was always put on the road user. Oh, you're not wearing a helmet, or you're not wearing a seatbelt, or you're speeding, which is a part of it, but we, we're talking of a bigger system. So why we need NGOs to catalyze this political will? And, and by, this can be NGOs, but this can also be academia or other organizations, because we can advocate for the implementation of evidence-based interventions. So for example, when we are looking for these partnerships, advocating for implementing um, evidence-based intervention is one of our cards to make sure that others want to work with us. Uh, or to also to make sure who are we selecting to work with us. So we have to have a common ground. Also, NGOs are able to hold governments to account to deliver. And uh, NGOs working from, from a grassroots level, but also from, yeah, even if you don't work from a grassroots level, NGOs are provide information. We, we, we democratize the information. And why that information is important? Because we can empower communities to understand that it's our right to demand this safe system approach. It's our right to demand a, a system that put us in the center, the humans, and protect us. Next slide, please. So how can we bring partners together? So what can we do? And uh, I really like the way that, that, um, that, that Greg had the ecosystem and mentioning all the non all the, the, all the stakeholders, sorry, not, not only the non-governmental, non, non but, uh, but one of the ways to bring partners together is to find, find a common ground. And the reason why I put here all the, the icons of the sustainable development goals is because, as I mentioned towards the beginning, it was very easy for us to identify number three and 11, right? But if we want to find a common ground and start bringing others to our common cause of making roads safer, of making this public space uh, livable for humans are, are, and, and, not, uh, and not put us in danger. There are some other areas there, um, that are working on that as well and ha have like a really good connection with, with safer roads or road safety. And uh, one that it's a very hot topic right now is climate action. We know that if we have more um, active mobility, streets are safer and also uh, greener. We know if we lower speed limits, streets are safer and also greener and so on. Um, we also have gender equality. There's plenty of evidence that shows that women um, have, they have to take specific decisions on, on how to move around because of gender inequality. And also we know that women use, 65% of the women, are, uh, sorry, 65% of the users of public transport are women. So there, there is uh, a thing between gender and how we move around. Um, and also we, we could um, include as part of this quality of education because have a, having a safe, a safe journey to school is part of having good education. If I have to be worried on how I get to school, I might not perform the, the, the best way. I, I mean, I think all of us have seen images from different parts of the world and specifically, especially Africa or even Asia and how are the, the, the routes to school or even in rural areas in Latin America, we have this issue as well. So we can find a common ground to start building these partnerships, not only with the ecosystem that we have of people that have been working in road safety for a long time, but also with others. And why is this important? Because we can build a stronger advocacy case. Having a common ground, basing um, our, our actions on evidence, it's going to, to give us a stronger case to advocate for those, for those uh, interventions that we know we need. For safer roads, for uh, cleaner cities and also for gender equality. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to share with you, because we, we have faced this with our member NGOs when we have done online ses uh, training sessions, is that, okay, I have this map or this uh, power map of different stakeholders, like the one or, or, or the ecosystem, like the one that Greg showed us. And sometimes we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough staff, or we don't have enough time to connect with all of them, right? So, so sometimes we need to prioritize partners. And, and, and the first thing to start prioritizing partners is understanding what is our objective. So for example, if, if in your case, your objective is to um, commit your local municipality or the local authority um, to use star rating for schools in more schools, then, for that specific objective, you have to start prioritizing your partners. And why I'm saying this, because for that objective, your partners might be different if what you want is to implement the road assessment program for highways. Um, because there probably you will need to advocate 
very hard with the private companies and concessionaries and probably with the Ministry of Transport and maybe the Ministry of Finance because the, uh, those are going to be your, 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 your players, whereas for school it would be a different set of, of partners. And uh, we usually like to use this matrix to identify what are the values that these different partners in, in this ecosystem have uh, and understand where to put our, our strength. And um, we, we usually find those that have a high importance but low influence. And it, it, why they could have a high importance? Because for us, they might be important because they, they, they have been working in the cause, but they might have a low influence because they, they might not achieve uh, the result that we want just partnering with them. Just to put a very concrete example, if we were thinking of, let's say, the star rating for schools, um, maybe the parents of the kids, they are very important to us, but maybe depending on the city, depending on the community, they have very low influence. So maybe that's not the group we want to prioritize. Uh, then we have this group that is the one that we have to analyze in advance and make sure that we're not putting all our efforts there, which is low importance and low influence, because they might have some limited involvement, um, but definitely they have a low priority. Uh, then we have the group of low importance by high influence. And this a lot of times happens, um, at, at least it happened to me a couple of times when I was so in my own road safety bubble that I couldn't see beyond that. And I couldn't see that probably when I was working, let's say, for lower speed limits, that actually I should have gone to cyclist associations. Cyclists are great activists. They are like, they have great ideas, they are super creative, but sometimes working only in our road safety bubble, we forget of these groups. And that group would be of a high influence because of the people that they reach, because of the tactics or the activities that they can have. Um, and then finally, we have the cherry of the group, the cherry on top, and those are the ones with high importance and high influence. Um, and these are the ones that it's important to build a, a good relationship with. For me, when I have to identify those with high importance and high influence, I tend to think if they are the ones who influence the policy and who have the budget for the execution of it. Um, and again, this doesn't mean that we're talking about parliamentarians or the head of a road safety agency or a minister. This could be a CEO of a company. Um, so this is a bit of uh, food for thought. Uh, each of you know what is your ecosystem, how your community looks like, but this is um, a matrix that we, we like to use it when we have to start playing chess in this advocacy game. Um, next slide, please. So. As Judy mentioned, um, the Alliance did a big push last year with, uh, with our stakeholders, with our members, with, with other partners to make sure to, to have as many uh, ministers or national authorities aware that there was a global plan for the next decade of action. And uh, the result was that today we have 36 countries, this um, infographic is its all, but Malawi uh, handed over the plan last week and that makes country 36. And, uh, and this means that in each of these countries, um, we ask the NGOs there to connect with other NGOs, but also with other organizations to, to have a, 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 um, a significant event or sorry, a symbolic event where the plan was handed over. And I'm putting this as, last, as a last line and, and as an example, because for example, in a country um, like uh, Uruguay, I'm talking about that because that's where I'm from and it's easier for me. Um, there was one NGO who led the process, but they were uh, with the, the, the WHO officer in the country uh, and when they handed over the plan to the parliamentarians in Montevideo. Um, we know, for example, that in India, we have a lot of NGOs there and we require them to get together so their authorities were not receiving a thousand letters. And, and they managed to do it per state, but we had groups of like five or six NGOs handing over the plan to their state authorities. Um, and, and we saw like a really good result out of this. Um, it's something that empowered NG our NGOs and showed us that they were able to reach really high level um, authorities. Most of them reached their, their ministers um, and, uh, and it was a great way to start the conversation again about putting road safety on the, on the national agenda. I think that's all for me today. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, do not hesitate to yeah, open your, uh, ask to Franco to open your mic or, or you can type it on the, on the chat. 
thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you, Greg, and, and thank you, Judy, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, as Valeria just said, uh, now it's time for uh, opening um, the mics and ask some questions. We do have two questions. I would like to start with Ahmed question, uh, but Ahmed, let me uh, let me let you ask your the question yourself. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah, thank you. Are you thank there? You. Yeah, you hear me? Yeah, great. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Franco, and thanks for the other presentations. Quite interesting. So my question is uh, about the uh, about the NGOs, because in in many low to middle income countries, NGOs are are conducting only campaigns for maybe uh, the uh, mobile phone or maybe for um, speeding. But uh, those campaigns are still very limited in evaluation. They do not go, do good evaluation of their campaigns. The governments hear them and um, promise to, to act, but the commitment is always limited. We don't see it as, um, as, um, as a good commitment. So my question is, is there any good practice guides for NGOs to be more effective in decision making? Or is there any sort of case studies that we can apply for low to middle income countries? I guess that's a question for me, but please, Greg or, or Judy, jump in if you if you also have examples. Um, thank you, Ahmed. Um, so from from the side of the of the NGOs, yes, we have seen that typically the NGOs have been seen of, as as organizations mobilizing for social media campaign and 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 messaging and awareness. Um, but that is one part of the campaign. But also another part of the campaign is the advocacy done directly with the decision makers. Last year, we, we issued a publication that's called Meaningful Participation Guide for, for, um, for NGOs. And in that, in that guide, we, we, had, we highlighted seven things that are necessary so you can have a good participation with your decision makers. Um, in the case of what you're asking, if there's like a, an assessment done of, of how campaigns from road safety NGOs have, have been, globally, I know, I know there's not. Um, we have from the UN Road Safety Weeks, the results of the campaigns, what means in terms of reach and, and how many commitments were made, but we have not yet made an assessment on how those global campaigns have worked. Locally, I can imagine the, yes, and, and you can also benchmark with other causes such as, for example, tobacco um, or even um, alcohol, that th there are good results about like advocacy campaigns uh, run by NGOs. But uh, I don't know, Greg or Judy, if you want to add Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess what I would also add is, like from our perspective, we, we're the, one of the programs we work very closely with NGOs, particularly is through the Star Rating for Schools program. And one of our, our principles or, or approaches with that is to be able to develop that tool, which is an evidence-based tool and driven by data, that is, is something that the NGOs can use so that um, they don't need to sort of um, have pre-existing expertise necessarily. The tools helps to give them that evidence base and strong base to build a campaign and build advocacy around. Um, so that's sort of how we encourage um, through our programs, the NGOs, um, one approach that the NGOs can take is to take that evidence based tool. Um, but more generally too, and I think, uh, by the way, um, Bale mentioned the Meaningful Participation Guide. It's in the link in, in, the, in your um, menu here as one of the handouts. Definitely worth a read. Um, but I think also campaigns often work best when they're linked to some other initiative rather than as a standalone thing. So a campaign about the need for investment in safer roads is going to work better if there's a really some strong data to support it. So you might have done an IRAP assessment and found the one and two star sections of road and then build a campaign um, that works with the government and works to build the community awareness about the importance of investment around that evidence base. Or for example, um, a campaign about trying to get people to wear seat belts is going to work much better when it's accompanied by a police enforcement program to enforce the, the use of seat belts at the same time. So the campaign really becomes about supporting the enforcement effort 
rather than just trying to change people's minds just by by changing their heart um, alone it's sort of accompanied by that enforcement component um, so i think yeah being being working with the ngos to to find ways to help build that evidence base and that that's i guess a strong and tangible component that it supports is really valuable as well thank you greg and and, and bao for for that answer and I would like uh, Ronald as well to, to take the floor. Uh, let me allow you to do so, Ronald. Give me one second. And then Andrew, Andrew, I, I, it's not that I don't want to unmute you, but your question is a little bit more directed to Greg. So we, we will leave that for, for, for the end maybe, but you will have the mic as well. <laughs> Go ahead, Ronald. Yes. Good afternoon from Tanzania. My name is uh, Ronald Rakatare. I'm an engineer working in the government. Uh, I really appreciate the efforts to train experts using the road safety tools, the IRAP tools. And uh, as I, I don't know whether I, uh, it's, you call it conflict of interest, I'm also undergoing the trainings. I've done the star rating trainings and so on. But what I noted is that I see there are a number, many of them being trained, but some are not all in the road agencies. Some are working in consultancies, some are freelance uh, engineers, and so on. So I wish to know what is the strategy to uh, make full use of them in uh, in, in, the, in this uh, in your plans, because uh, I know that people are from different uh, areas, and uh, what brings them together to do the work that you plan to do? Thank you. Great, right. muted. Thank, thanks, Ronald. Fantastic question, and yeah, really great to hear that you're taking the training, and and hopefully you're you're going to get through it uh, without too much stress. Um, I think yeah, one of let me give you one example. In, in in Brazil, I think is a fantastic example about how they've structured an ecosystem to really match up to to their needs. Um, so one of the things that the government said quite early on was. Of course, within the government, we want to develop the capability to use the IRAP tool. So our staff need to know how to uh, do the coding, for example, and understand and interpret the results. But they also said that when they want to do the IRAP assessments, they're keen to be able to call on competitive or call on consultants to bid to do that as projects so they can do competitive tendering. So they might say, okay, we want to do an assessment of 5,000 kilometers of roads. We want local consultants who can bid to do that work and we will pick the best price to do that work. And they didn't particularly want international consultants only being the ones that could do it. They want local consultants and local capability. So what they said, they made it very clear that in the future when we do IRAP assessments on our network, we're going to call for consultants to, to do that work. But in order to do it, you have to be accredited. You have to hold the IRAP accreditation. So they worked with the local, one of the local universities uh, and the IRAP team to provide training to the consultants. Um, so they said, we're going to be running training. Um, you're welcome to come and take that training. And after you take that training, you can apply for accreditation. After you have accreditation, then you're eligible to, to bid for the projects. So that, that ecosystem that they built includes a, a very strong network of consultants who are capable of doing the IRAP assessments and the government capable of receiving that data and making good use of it and, and calling for tenders. And so there's that clear role for, for the government engineers and for the consulting engineers to, to play that, that role together. And in that case, in many cases, the government engineers aren't always the ones that do the assessments. Many times it might be the research institutes or the consultants who actually do the assessments. And then the government engineers take the results and turn them into designs and, and implement and, and support the planning process. So that's one way that it could happen at TAN roads. You might say, okay, we want to do an IRAP assessment of our roads um, and we call for the local consultants to, to make proposals um, to do that. Thank you, Greg, uh, for, for your answer. And thank you, Ronald, also uh, for your question. And now, yeah, I would like Andrew to to go ahead and, and ask uh, his question. Actually, this one was the first that was submitted. So go ahead, Andrew. 
Thanks, Franco, and thanks everyone else, uh, Valeria, Greg, and uh, Judy, for your presentations. Um, I, I will go off track a little bit. I did have a question for Greg, but I'm actually going to direct something to Valeria in the first instance, because what really resonated with me was the um, the notion of empowering the community. Um, like Ronald, I am an engineer, and I'm working for in the in the government. I'm a practitioner. Um, <clears throat> I suppose we have influence over two pillars road infrastructure and speeds um not drivers not cars vehicles um <clears throat> i think the to me um immobilizing the community to demand road safety is is what's required what what would really drive road safety i mean we've had um black lives matter the me too movement very powerful community um, demands for change. If we can get that with road safety, you mentioned cyclists, Valeria, um, as as powerful activists. The, the most powerful activists that aren't mobilised surely are pedestrians. Everybody is a pedestrian. They're the literally the most. They're literally marginalised to the edges of the road corridor. Um, how how do we how do we mobilise them? Thank you for your question, Michael. So um, I think we have a huge challenge there because when we were saying empowering communities, um, it's actually empowering communities to reclaim their right to be safe on the roads. So so I think we need to, when, when designing a campaign, and, and we have discussed this plenty within our organization, um, we what we want is to people to make, to be aware that they is their right to be safe on the roads, is their right to, to, to have a footpath to be able to walk is is their right to have a cycle pass to be able to cycle um safely and and as a as a driver also it's my right to make sure that to to have the the, the good infrastructure that will protect all of us on the roads because obviously i don't want to be responsible of, of a crash of running over someone um so i think this this starts from a very grassroots level of like changing uh, the the mind of, of the the society in a way um, where, where we're usually very used to campaigns that are about behavioral change. We're very used to campaigns of seat belts, of not drink, drinking and driving, of, speed, of, of lower speed limits uh, for, for the drivers. But, but it's about for us to reclaim our, our space on the roads as, as road users. Because as you said, we are all pedestrians because when you're going to drive, you have to walk at least probably, I don't know, five, ten meters, depending where you park. Um, and so at some point, we, we all are pedestrians. And, uh, and how we target those groups, I think that is about finding this common ground. And it's not only uh, for those working on road safety, it's finding that common ground for all of us, because all of us are users of the roads. And, and that's why I was making this point about like trying to, to tackle with the other SDGs, where, where we, have, we have seen, as you mentioned, the Me Too movement was gigantic, different groups being very effective at the moment of saying, actually, that is my right, I'm, I'm entitled, uh, to do this, and the government should guarantee this safety for me in this specific space. Um, I don't know if I answered your question because it's a very uh, long-term um, goal that we have, but but I think we're changing the narrative, and and that is the first step that we're doing to start empowering the communities. Thanks, Valeria. And 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 if you'll um, forgive me, I, I will ask the original question that I had for Greg. Um, it 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 was. Um, about the automated IRAP, the RAP collection, the, the, um, one of our challenges as a, as a road agency is the collection of that data. Um, it, is, it is a blockage to actually doing um, the, the RAP analyses. And so automated collection is very exciting. Um, what, I suppose my curiosity is, what, what did, are all the attributes collected aut automatically or, or some? Um, how does it work? Or is, is that too yeah, detailed so, for this forum? Oh, oh, I'll try to give a, a quick one. Um, and but very happy to have a, have a separate call with you to, to talk more about that. Um, and uh, it's, it's super, super um, popular topic as well. So you're not the only one who wants to know more about it. So uh, I think we'll need to run a separate session on it. But um, at the moment, no, it's, it's not collecting all the data yet. Um, and where the, the process is, is not taking any one approach. It's, it's really about um, 
either using technology to try and automate that coding, um, for example, from LiDAR data, um, so LiDAR data that's already been collected previously, using the software to try and um, uh, measure the attributes. And like the, the, we're sort of getting in the range of like seven to up to 30 of the attributes being collected in one form or another um, in some sort of automated way um, out of some of the projects that we're doing. Um, and in some cases, it's very straightforward. The data can be collected and categorized quite easily. In some cases, it can sort of be half categorized and then still need some human intervention to, to check it. Um, and the, the different sources are, are things like the satellite imagery that we were talking about, the LiDAR um, data, the image recognition um, software that is being used. So it's a whole range of different things. But one of the other areas that we're, we're also very keen on is um, whether or not the asset databases of road authorities can be tapped into to you and transformed into the IRAP um, uh, data as well. So if the asset database already has information about paved shoulders and uh, like roadside objects and that sort of thing, can that be automatically brought across into the IRAP categories and, and used for star ratings? Um, so at the moment, not quite. Um, it's not, not there yet able to code all the attributes, but it's coming very quickly. Um, like the, 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 the leaps that have been made in the last couple of years alone have been really, really impressive. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank have developed a, a piece of software, uh, they call it Via Segura, um, which is, is one example of um, a piece of kit that can, can code, I think, 16 or 17 of the IRAP attributes automatically. Um, so that's, that's one that's really exciting and, and has a lot of potential. And one of the reasons they stopped at 16 is they just didn't have enough image data yet to feed to it. Um, sort of to teach the machines and the algorithms to, to recognize the imagery it takes quite a lot of, of images. I think they said they have to look at sort of 5,000 versions of a thing like a pedestrian crossing before the, the algorithm really understands it. So it's just a matter of feeding some of those um, systems so that they can learn more and more quickly. Um, so the, the work that we've done with the New South Wales government, um, that covered 20,000 kilometres of, of data and I think they um, yeah, covered up to about 34 different attributes in that package of work. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. But yeah, very happy to have yeah, that. Yeah, really good. Bit. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Valeria. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Valeria, for, for your answers. And also thank you, Andrew, for, for your questions. Um, if you recall, in the beginning of this meeting on the housekeeping, I said that we were taking 75 minutes. We are reaching uh, the 75 minutes. So let me give you just some final information. Um, our resources uh, that we have available for you. Um, you are seeing it on my screen now. We have the steps to create in a wrap and helpful resources web page, the, uh, the road sorry, safety toolkit, the vaccines for roads, the IRAP website, the star rating for schools, uh, the newsletter sign up, uh, which I really recommend you if you haven't to, to sign up for that, to receive and to keep on track of everything that we do. And the VIDA online software uh, also available. And also let me remind you of our trainings. Uh, you, you may know already that IRAP offered training to the professionals that will perform uh, the IRAP methodology, uh, as it was said in, in one of the questions uh, before. And here are some topics of the trainings that, that we deliver. We have the introduction to IRAP. Um, the star rating essentials, uh, which is uh, the baseline for technical uh, knowledge on, on our courses, the star rating for designs, some courses on project planning, establishing a wrap, um, which is a, a, a great course as, as well, the how to achieve a star rate, rating target, uh, the building your coding skills, and of course, our star rating for schools uh, training courses. If you have any interest in undergoing any of these courses, you can go ahead and, well, of course, enter it to your to our website to get more information, but get in touch with me and I will happily provide you with more information and make you uh, go through the path of getting enrolled to the courses and 
learning and of course having having a great time uh, in the in the process. We offer these courses in different uh, languages. We have some courses in English, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian, and French, and also in Vietnamese. And we can tailor something specific according to uh, the project and the organization uh, needs. So far, uh, just to put a figure on this, uh, 47,000 people have attended to our presentation and training courses. And these courses can lead to, to an IRAP accreditation, uh, which is IRAP uh, backing up your knowledge uh, of, of, of the usage of the tools for you uh, going out and doing uh, real life uh, projects, right? Because saving life, it's, it's saving lives is going to be very important when doing uh, the project, of course. So uh, just before you go, a brief survey will be shared with you shortly. And we would really appreciate if you could take the time to complete it. It's, it's very important for us. Uh, we would really like to hear what you have thought of the presentation of today and what you would like to hear on the following Coffee and Connect uh, sessions. And remember that uh, you, you should expect to get a link to the presentation and to the video uh, within tomorrow, hopefully. And thank you so much uh, for having taken the time of being here. Here is the information, the contact information of, of Judy, judy.williams at irap.org. And you can contact us uh, whenever you want or whenever you need further information. So thanks for, for, for being here and for taking the time. Have a great day. Uh, have a great afternoon, depending on when uh, or where you are. Thank you.